Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. See people are still kind of rolling in. Um, really appreciate your time. I know today we have folks from around the country, which is amazing. So really thankful that you all are here. Uh, my name is Erin Smith. I'm the program manager for alumni events at the College of Engineering and Applied Science. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our alumni brewer, Jason Zumbrennan. Jason received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering at CU in 1997. His path after graduation included working in industry, touring the world with his band, and eventually making it back to Colorado to get into brewing. Jason, along with his business partners, opened Ratio Beer Works in Denver in 2015. You may recognize Jason from some of our other alumni events as well. Back in March 2019, we hosted an event at Ratio for our Front Range Alumni Network. And Ratio has always been at the Alumni Association's Buffs on Tap event that they host during Homecoming Week. And most recently, Jason came to our Engineering Homecoming tailgate this past fall to help pour his beer and meet some fellow engineering buffs before the game. Jason, we always have a great time partnering with you and we're so excited to have you back with us to host this happy hour. I'll go ahead and kick it over to you and I'm thinking we can start uh, doing a tasting of one of the beers you selected for us. Okay, yes, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for being here. Um, I guess, yeah, we'll go right into beer because why not? It's five o'clock, right? So we'll do that and then we'll talk about engineering and beer and other things first. So I think we're gonna start with rooftops. I don't know if there was an order, but that's the one I opened first. So that's now the order. Sometimes my dad's statistician, sometimes it's just like, well, you just gotta pick something and then you go from there and that, that's the path. So that's our rooftops. This is our Mexican lager. This actually too, why it's kind of fun. I chose three of our beers. We went into cans and we'll go into that later, but kind of our pivot through the pandemic. And this was the first one we did. A little bit out of coincidence, but it was good timing going into spring and now summer that it's really a, a, a light drinking beer. You know, this is basically a Vienna lager, a little bit with some corn in there that typically lightened it up. So this is a light drinking, low hop, crisp beer. And I'll pour a little, I suppose, here too. This one's a good one to drink out of the can though, to be honest. <laughs> but, but we'll show, and actually pretty fun. I don't know if you can see very well, but it's pretty fairly clear. We don't filter here, but this would traditionally be a filtered beer, um, but we just use with time and age. So we'll do a cheers first. And if whatever anyone's drinking, this is what I'm drinking. Mm, oh yeah, that one, that's good. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. Oh, that's a good one. So it tasted that. That's good. Um, out of that, you'll get a little bit of salinity kind of out of the tasting notes for this beer. Like I said, the corn lightens it up. But they're seeing the corn lightens it up. And but with the low hop, you get almost a touch of sweetness in it. So um, while it is a dry beer and just a little under 5%. So we likely are going to continue doing this beer maybe year round. Unless someone has a cure for COVID out there, then it might be a season. Okay, okay so that's beer number one. Cheers, everyone. Awesome. Love it. Cheers. So I kind of gave a very uh, cursory introduction for you, Jason, but why don't you tell us a little bit more, maybe start with your time at CU, kind of what inspired you to get a chemical engineering degree. Um, maybe start a little bit there. Sure. Yep. Um, I went, I'm from Colorado originally for Collins, and I took it to other places to go, but I got scholarship so it made it really easy. So I was there in 1997, and partially I had a sister in chemical engineering at CSU. My dad's a professor at CSU in the statistics lab, I think I mentioned. So that was actually pretty uh, controversial that I bailed on uh, CSU to go down to CU. But anyways, it was great, glad I did. Um, beyond that, I just love chemistry and math. And especially back then, any of you who were around that time, 93 to 97, there really wasn't YouTube or any of that. So besides people you talk to about degrees, I didn't know about any other professions. <laughs> so that one sounded nice. Um, getting into beer though, I took a food science courses too, did biotechnology option on it. And we toured at the time uh, Boulder Beer, and we went out and toured a cheese farm. If anyone had uh, Professor Gamoff, 
and it was awesome. And probably about a week later, my roommate and I bought a homebrew kit. I think that's probably our junior year by then and started brewing terrible beer, but, but we also were exposed to good craft beer there, you know, Walnut Brewery at the time making Buff Gold and Boulder beer. Um, so I wasn't, didn't realize, you know, how lucky we had it at the time. So, but yes, um, did a little bit of an engineering job. I went to Houston that moved me to Los Angeles in plastic. So for a couple years, I did uh, a little bit of engineering and then immediately quit and toured around with my punk rock band for about three years. We toured the world doing that, making no money, but having a blast and seeing the world and getting exposed to all the world beers. Then went into the film industry for a while at like Blu-ray, then decided wanted to get into beer full time, especially living near San Diego and what Colorado was doing. So I went back to school. I went to Siebel in Chicago and over to Doman's Academy in Munich, Germany, just knowing, hey, I needed that uh, technical background. And then here we are. Awesome, so I think you touched on a couple things. It sounds like you've traveled the world with your band. Um, I'm kind of curious, did that influence the type of styles of beer that you brew? It sounds like you've tried a lot of different things in different countries. What inspiration did you pull from that? Oh yeah, completely. And one of the reasons I wanted to go to Germany was when we were touring through there, to me, Germany really invented modern brewing. I mean, there's, you know, from the Egyptians and, you know, if you look back through the history of brewing, it goes way back. But until uh, Louis Pasteur and understanding microbiology, they didn't really know what was going on. They started having an idea, but once uh, microsotes came around and they figured out, hey, this was yeast that was doing the fermentation. And not only that, you could isolate certain strains for flavors. The Germans got really good at doing it. Um, especially the Southern Germans and the Bavarians, but they also tend to be very anal and uh, kind of somewhat of an engineering mindset. And I liked that for learning, but then applying that into kind of creative American brewing scene. And yeah, tasting all over. Um, but remember at the time too, there wasn't a lot of craft beer, but it was fun to just see how beer was consumed around the world, everywhere. It was this common connection. I think maybe that more than anything tied me into wanting to be a part of that. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit, taking that leap. Um, I know we actually got quite a few questions. It sounds like there's some folks on the call who are interested in maybe getting into the craft beer business, starting their own business. How did you make that decision? What were some of the challenges that you faced um, starting your own business? Sure. And assuming everyone's an engineer or somehow related engineering, I'll give a little of that perspective where in general, a stereotype, we tend to be analytical, think through these processes, problem solving and starting a business. And in this analog idea of beer was quite a leap even for me. So it's one of those things you could plan forever and never do it. So a few of them were driven by the idea of the film job I was in was great, but I could also see the writing on the wall. Technology was robots were going to replace what I was doing, probably. <laughs> so that always helps having a little bit of a driver under your butt of like, hey, I don't know if my industry is going to be around. Um, and then also really going back to a really simple mantra of kind of that one step in front of the other. There's a lot of planning, but then there's that idea of you got to take that first step. And that really helped almost at every step. If I got not lost, but felt the chess match was too big. I kept saying, okay, well, I planned out this far. Let's take that next step. And sometimes that led on the path. Um, it also helped, that's why I found that when we first founded it with two other partners, was being really honest about what I was gonna do or was good at and what I wasn't and finding other people. So my other main partner now is more of the accounting business finance. He's also a CU grad from, uh, leads school business. So that helps a lot, but also it's funny the confidence you get going back to school and having a base training, going, um, maybe people, I think there's a question about like funding for this and maybe we can go into it later, but it was the thing I thought I, uh, there was, couldn't be more different part of my world, very alien. But I found I actually, I actually started having success even over sometimes, sometimes my business partner because I had already dove full into brewing. I went back over to brewing school. So it was amazing of knowing what you're doing and being able 
tell the story of what you want to do. And even though I didn't have the finance, I thought everyone with ROIs and would get really technical. In reality, they wanted to know that you cared, you've thought about your plan, and you know what you're doing. More, almost more than getting into nitty gritty details. It was pretty interesting, for sure. So having that passion and kind of showing your drive helped a lot. Yeah, and once again, by, by going to school and setting the plan and starting the things, it was really easy to talk about. You didn't have to make any of it up. And it showed, you know, it showed a clear, consistent path towards at least what we wanted to do. And it was actually pretty easy to talk about. And I got over the intimidation of, hey, maybe not knowing high level finance of how to structure any deal. But I found some of these, you know, we went through angel investor, private investors. A lot of them didn't care that much either. They have people advising them on that part too. <laughs> In fact, one of our, our investors was uh, from Boulder and was part of investing at SketchUp, which Google later bought and had a lot of, has become a board of advisor on our board of advisors now. That idea of he was very helpful of realizing you don't need to know everything, know what you're good at and be able to explain it. Awesome, I think that's some pretty good advice. Um, we have some other questions here too. I think people are curious about the home brewing aspect. So if someone is just now getting into home brewing, are there any shops around the Denver area that you recommend? Is there any like club, homebrew club that you are involved with? Um, kind of how should people start? Sure, um, yeah, uh, a shop is a great place, both, both for going to get your things and connecting. And the people there tend to be super experts. What's interesting, I didn't get into a lot of the homebrew clubs. I did it myself, but where I was in, in California, but especially the forums online are amazing. And I'll, a little of my inside secret, when I'm crafting a new recipe that I know I want to do, I'll usually first take some styles maybe that I know is good and maybe I want it between two styles. But I'll literally go on homebrew boards because I'll tell you this, they're the people that it's their intense hobby. And there's people that will brew the same batch of beer a hundred times in a row. <laughs> and frankly, we don't have the time to do that, that much R and D. So it gives me a good starting place. I'm like, wow, I'm glad you're that obsessed with, and especially if they're trying to do a clone recipe. <laughs> so it's amazing. That gives me a starting point. So I still use it. So anyways, here in Denver, there's one literally two blocks from ratio called, um, I Al altitude, altitude. It's right here on Walnut and like 28th. Um, I, I, I go over there, I forget the name now. But uh, what's funny is sometimes we even get small other parts, tubes or things if we run out of parts here. But um, yeah, that's how I got into it. Like you said, it was terrible at first. I will give this other advice. You don't need to go necessarily right into full grain brewing, but it is the fun part and it's pretty cheap. You could do it with Coleman coolers. And I would recommend if you enjoy it, I'll just jump quite to that step because I think that's the real brewing part of it. You can start with some of the extract brewing and you can make good beers, but you, you can at least do some of that pretty cheaply, a less than maybe a hundred bucks for some extra, the extra parts. Um, and that really feels like, wow, I'm turning these grains, these starches into sugars and you feel a little bit of that chemistry in there. That's awesome. That was exactly actually the next question we had. So I think you covered that of feel free to just dive right into that all grain brewing and Yeah, the one other that you know, I said we made terrible beer when we were first starting out. The one other great thing, we have such good yeast suppliers, which is kind of an overlooked part when people are first thinking about beer. But um, we have a where we get our yeast from where they grow our yeast is here in Denver. It's called Inland Island. And they actually have a homebrew division. So you can get actually really fresh Denver ground yeast, if anyone's from Denver, um, and or any big city now, yeast suppliers are growing now. And so that's probably one of the best improvements that's happened in homebrewing is be able to get this fresh yeast for your beer. Awesome. So you kind of, you mentioned something that I was planning to ask about, um, sort of when you're coming up with new recipes, Talked a little bit about the process, but how are you guys deciding what you actually want to brew and make? Yeah, so it can be interesting. There can be a couple different pathways. A few is, you know, when we were opening, I wanted to make a wide range of styles that 
weren't, you know, we didn't want to just be like an IPA brewery or a massive alcohol brewery. In fact, that was kind of the trend for a while, both in Southern California, like stone, everything was bitter and IPAs, which was delicious. I loved it. And then even in Colorado, a little bit of the trend at the time was high alcohol, high octane, everything. And it's best described like uh, Dale's Pale Ale, which is Oscar Blues. The fact that it's even called a pale ale, if you look at it by any standard, it's an IPA. It's, it's high enough in alcohol and it's high enough bitterness. But that kind of personified or was could, or summed up the Colorado style at the time was make everything bigger and bolder. So we wanted to have a wide range. So some of it took beers I loved and what I liked to drink and was like, can we do our version of that? But maybe with our twist on it. At the time I started drinking Saison's, Dear You is one of our flagship beers. And it's a French Saison that we have year round, which is unusual. At the time, I loved things like um, Tank 7 from Boulevard out of Kansas City. And then even here in town, Great Divide had um, Colette. Those are both massive beers. They're like 8% alcohol. But a traditional Saison over from Belgium is a lighter alcohol, easy drinking you know, beer for the farm hands. So we wanted to go back to that, but then the modern twist kind of on it was we used an American hop, a citra hop, to add a little citrusy note, earthy and super crisp. So some of those I would take an old style and maybe a little bit of the twist that I liked. And then other times, sometimes out of collaboration or interesting things, especially if we brew with fruits, trying to find balance out of fruit, coriander or whatever products we're using. Then we might go to our pilot system and do it on a one barrel first. For example, actually, let's go, let's go to one of them. Should we go to a beer? Let's do it, <laughs> yeah. Let's go to New Wave next. So this one's our, is that the right order or does it doesn't matter? Doesn't matter, do what you want, yeah. Our strawberry <laughs> Berliner Weiss. So back to an old German style, which was a sour, mashed soured or kettle soured typical beer, very low alcohol traditionally in the threes. And um, you let lactobacillus bacteria sour it for you. Um, this is a perfect one. I went to a few conferences and wanted to start doing some kettle sours and, but had never done it, even home brewing. So this is one we definitely did on our 30 gallon pilot system and did several batches just to see if we get the sourness right and the bacteria right. Um, what's great is strawberry is a really hard beer. I'm gonna open it as we talk. It can be so subtle in beer. But what is great is the bacteria we use, we actually grow up from yogurt. Um, to make it really easy, a lot of Greek yogurts you have is the same bacteria that grows naturally on, on barley. So we actually grow it up. We don't say it, but usually we use Nusa as our medium to grow our bacteria. It's a Nusa yogurt. There's a Colorado brand for you. How much yogurt do you need to do this? Not very much. Okay. So, you know, we have a, our batch size is 20 beer barrels, which for no apparent reason is 31 gallons. It's an old English measurement that they don't use anymore either. They went metric, but we still use it in America. Let's show about 600 gallon batches. So for 600 gallon batches, our media that we grow up with some wort is maybe four tins of yogurt. So anyone who's also well, chemies out there or has biology in their background, the amazing power of uh, doubling your growth, you don't need that much to really get it going. There's a lot of techniques to get the bacteria to really go and put out that um, lactic acid. Um, keep it at a hotter temperature, but not too hot where you kill it. But anyway, so what you get is a lactic acid, which is a food acid you have in like Greek yogurts nice and tart and clean, pairs well with citric acid too. And so strawberries, we just found, we played around with a few different fruits. We just love the balance that it kind of made the strawberry pop. The strawberry normally gets lost, but that tanginess, when you think more that beer is food, it's kind of like salt. A little bit of acid can help express flavors. So cheers. So this is a fun one that we usually do sometime in the summer. They are kind of a pain in the ass for us to brew because it ties up our kettle for a couple days. We actually bring it over, mash in like normal, and we bring it up to a quick boil to kill off anything that bacteria or wild yeast we don't want. 
Then we have to cool it back down to about 60 Celsius or so, 65, 60. So pretty hot, but not too hot. So it will kill yeast, but not bacteria. And then we pitch the, um, the medium that we've grown and it takes a couple days and we'll drop in pH down to about a low threes for a pH or so, if anyone out there knows how that tastes. It tastes about this tangy. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm curious, as brewmaster, can you tell us a little bit about what does your day-to-day -day look like? What are you doing, you know? Is this BC before COVID or, or during? Give us both. Give us both, <laughs> actually. COVID <laughs> right now. So um, before we were growing enough, um, we had hit about 4,000 barrels of beer last year, which is about 8,000 kegs equivalent. So we were growing nicely, starting to look at production facilities. I was starting to transition to planning mode again, to find another facility to um, build another brewery so we could can. So we actually hired a lead brewer and we had two other brewers behind that. So I had almost completely stepped out of day-to-day -day brewing, day-to-day -day brewing. I still do all the recipe development. Um, I still do all the ordering. And the other big one, my engineering background, I didn't want to give up per se, is creating a way to track speed of sales, not only for inventory, but of how, when we brew. Uh, one of the hardest things in brewing is we have a, um, a product with a expiration date. It's, this is not whiskey that will last for years. So, you know, we might only have a couple months. IPAs last less. Some beers might last three months. So you can't overbrew either. So I do all that planning as well. Um, during COVID, <laughs> first you do a little of everything. Unfortunately, especially as it started, we lost a good chunk of our staff as we closed down when we were doing mostly draft. But now I've been building out our front patio on, on Larimer because we shut it down. Um, pivoting into lots of different roles of just ways we can survive. Getting into canning, we have a new lead brewer that's really came from another brewery. So we got our canning line up and running. So sourcing all that, that's been nuts. So basically lots of little projects. It feels like project management. Awesome. Um, so I'm kind of curious too, you actually have awesome designs um, for your artwork on your cans and you guys have your Brewery, which I know you'll show us a little bit later is super fun. Um, what's that design process like and how do you kind of come up even with the names of your beers are super unique? Um, what are you guys doing? So actually Anna, who I see there's a caliper on that, helps set it up. We are our, um, our lead designer who is now also, once again, because of COVID taking over lots more marketing roles than she ever did before. But one of the reasons we knew kind of right away of, wow, we, we had the idea of pivoting the cans right away. Normally, we're really methodical. We're not actually super fast movers. You'll also notice we don't tend to do super hype beers right away. We're not cranking through crazy styles and throwing marshmallows just randomly. Now, we do. It's not that we don't do that, but we do try to, we're long term trying to stick around and grow some big, bigger brands. So we tended to be more disciplined. And we were just starting that process. We thought it, about a year we were going to take designing can labels for our flagships. And then COVID hit and it went from, we were just starting that project of like, hey, let's, it'll be about a year. And to our design process and sitting with Anna and she might work with outside designers as our lead designer to like, hey, Anna, can you design a label in like three weeks? And then, oh, by the way, can you design a label every week after that for the next five weeks? So now, it's been great. What's great is she had been on maybe at least a year or so. I don't know if she's here, but had already gotten our aesthetic down and our design. We do a lot of fun non-engineering um, brainstorm sessions, which are really fun of throwing out lots of words on post-it notes and feelings and fun stuff. <laughs> so then she takes all that, wraps it up into labels. But that's what we've been doing with almost all of this. Uh, we did partner with a group that came up with our original branding too. It's a thing neither my partner or I were good at and we knew the importance of it. So we did partner with people very early on. We knew it was a big part of what it was about of distinguishing your brand. 
Awesome. And awesome work for Anna for totally pivoting and getting that done super quickly. Um, I guess on that note, do you want to take a look at the canning line now or? Sure. To you. Sure. Yeah, let's try it. Oh, <laughs> cool. and then are we going to do the other beer, I guess, later? Because we can stand yeah. right canning lines right here. Perfect. Yeah, yeah perfect. I was going to mention one. Oh, you asked about really quickly our names. Usually there's a hint to some kind of music lyrics or a name. We never, you know, it's it's never direct, but we do like to put little Easter eggs in there. So almost all of our titles are some kind of lyric or a song title. Uh, so just thought I'd share that. But let's walk over to the end, which cool. is a few feet from here. <laughs> and this, hey, Sammy. Sammy will take this. Everybody. Okay, so here's okay. our brand. Yeah, I think that's looking good. Here's our brand new mini canning line built originally out of Boulder, Colorado, from Wild Goose Engineering, which was next to Upslope. And um, here I'll go down. No, that's okay. And they're now in Louisville. So they had just launched this little mini canning line about a month before COVID hit, and we had actually started thinking, hey, maybe we could buy this to do some specialties before we build our big brew house. So luckily we had already been talking to him and then as COVID hit and the reality of everything shutting down and we were only in draft, we very quickly were like, no, let's buy it just to have something to sell in stores. So that's what we did. This isn't really meant to do as much as we're going through it. I think we already hit about 75,000 cans in like 12 weeks, which is about triple anyone else. <laughs> Now, to be fair, we had, this is unit number two. So it is basically a beta unit. It's really good and ready to go. And all the parts are what are on their machines that have been around for years. But what's new you'll see is there's no touch panel. They were able to drop the price a lot by going to uh, taking all the, the control offline. So this is literally like a $120 Chromebook and it runs it awesome. <laughs> So, oh, I was going to show. Let's see if we can run it. I have water going to it now. It's been off for a while, so it may not be happy with us, but let's see if it does. So, you've got your can and feed here. You'll see there's a purger CO2 line here, and then the white is the fill tube of the beer. So, it purges. Can you ever hear me so? Fine. Okay. It purges the first can to displace all the oxygen with CO2, and then the, as it shoots to the next can, it'll fill bottom up with beer. It'll slide under a CO2 tube, and then it'll seam, have an automatic seamer. A robot arm grabs it and pulls it down the thing. So let's see, let's see if it works. Oh, there it goes. And it's going down, filling with water. I don't know if you can see, it'll grab it. <laughs> let's do another one. Yeah, let's do another one. Fill, 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 lift, robot arm. Oh, and now it didn't fill full. <laughs> and there you go. The magic and fun of packaging are, we got one out of two, so we're 50%. Now that awesome. one didn't, we're filling with slow water, so it didn't have a full fill, so the robot arm screwed up. But that is a, why packaging is very difficult. Everything has to be perfect. Um, wait, I want to show so one thing I know, by the way, anyone who's especially like a mechanical engineer out there, we, I want, we want your opinion on this. The one thing we have to do, it's fairly manual machine, but it's actually automatic once it's loaded. Everything else, including the labeling, happens automatically. The only thing that really sucks for how fast we're running it is, basically each time we're pushing the can by hand to reload it, and then it takes over. You'll see on the front here, there's a mounting plate. Oh wait, let's go over here too. We do a little pre-rinse thing that's a kind of manual, but what we want to be able to do, back up to here, is have some kind of loading system where we can preload like 20 cans once they're rinsed. That seems pretty easy. You could just have some twist rinse or a tray, or even maybe a little uh, um, conveyor belt. The one interesting thing is it has to have a decent amount of tension because it actually physically has to push the next can in. And that's our one thing. I mean, we were thinking as simple as almost like a, not really, but like a bungee cord idea where if you load it up a bunch, 
kind of a set tension as it as it went down, it still would push at a similar rate. It can't be too strong because we can't because uh, empty cans you can crush with like no uh, you know it's pretty easy. Crush, boom, now you're screwed. So, anyways, if anyone has a good idea, what'd be really cool is if we incorporated the rinser in there. So you just loaded the cans, they rinsed it, and then shoved it down in in there. So if anyone has some neat ideas, let us know. Okay, awesome. we'll go back. We'll go back here for right now. Cool. <laughs> and we're back. That's how big this brew house is. <laughs> so we did actually, we had a question come in from Jeff. Um, Jeff is asking, can you talk a little more about the process for canning versus bottling? What are the different trade-offs when you look at both? Um, kind of tell us about the engineering of both and, you know, yep. tasting uh, and marketing for both. Sure. So there's a couple things, like you said, there's some technical differences and then there's some that are kind of marketing differences. In general, for craft beer, the movement to aluminum cans which really started, by the way, still with Dale's, like, to give him credit, Oscar Blues. Um, you know, Coors helped invent the aluminum can with Ball way back when. But for a long time, only light lagers were in cans till, in aluminum cans until really Dale's. There's probably someone else doing it before, but they're the ones that pushed it nationally. In fact, saw it in California when it's out there. But, so that movement's gone, especially, or the idea that only cheap beer is in cans. And especially Colorado. So the idea that the idea you can bring this hiking, camping to venues um, has really been the switch. So one other positive, as most people know, it's a complete UV blockout. And one issue with beer, there's a compound in hops that reacts with UV light and you get skunking uh, flavor from it. There's some tricks and Frankenstein hops around it. But in general, even dark brown bottles still have some UV issues. The other big one environmentally is the weight. Um, if you've ever lifted a case of bottled beer versus a case of canned beer, you can carry about four times as much. So even just shipping around the idea of the weight of an aluminum can. So with that being said, our goal was always to go 100% only in cans for our flagships. Now that being said, we still like bottles and we actually bottle our specialty beers anything especially that we barrel age or maybe um, a sour barrel aged beer or a whiskey beer. We usually do those in bottles. It's a higher price point, a little more special. We're not moving around a lot of them. So that might be a $12 for a 375 milliliter bottle. So um, on the te other technical real quick is when you're filling, and then another engineering firm out of Golden called Cody Engineering started mastering one other problem. One neat thing with bottles, because there's a stiffness um, resistant when it's empty, they'll, they can purge oxygen from the beer before filling a lot better. What they'll do is they'll fill with CO2 like we did, but it'll actually then pull a vacuum and pull it out, fill, pull a vacuum. And you get a really good purge that way by filling and and sucking the vacuum a few times. Cans, as you just saw, are immensely strong when filled on outward, but when empty, you know, with, with my two fingers, you can crush. So you can see the problem of even pulling like a negative one PSI vacuum, or, or it's real low that you'll crush your can. It's been a problem a long time of really being able to purge cans well. Coors and those got over it because they just got their canning lines up to going like 20,000 cans a minute. So it's literally their purge. It's like, you can't even see it with your, the human eye of how fast it's moving. So they got over it by speed, but in craft, it's been a difficult challenge, but they've kind of figured out how to do it. And it's really delicate controls of being able to do a counter pressure uh, vacuum pull and then fill under pressure. So you can fill faster that way. So. Uh, canning is catching up to bottling in that way. And I'll also say, just on another note, if anyone's been brewing, bottling is so loud. It is like, if you've heard clinking bottles, that's what on a bottling line is like. You basically have to shove earplugs in all day and it's loud. And canning is just like feathers and angel dust. It's, well, not angel dust, but drug, <laughs> just angels. 
it's so nice and soft. That's awesome. That's great to yeah. know. <laughs> so now that you guys actually are doing six packs, are you, can we find you in local liquor stores? And then Kevin asked, um, what is your percent sales direct to consumer versus distribution? So yes, we're starting to get more and more into liquor stores. And in reality, you know, we first thought, well, we'll maybe keep a brand and this will be a transition as we build our next brew house. But we think obviously the, the dimmer switch of COVID is, you know, it's a dim, dimmer switch on, not a light switch. So we're gonna be in cans for the foreseeable future. So we'll be growing it. And in fact, Sammy is part of that team to grow it. So, um, we're in only in Denver and a little Boulder and one Long Long. Wiley's in Long Long. Wyatt's, sorry. Oh, we just went into Hazel's in Boulder. I think that's it for Boulder. We had just entered Boulder in draft this last year and have been doing more, um, in, you know, engineering events and CU alumni events. Well, actually done those for a few years. Um, and then I can't remember what the next part of that question was. <laughs> Uh, if you want to share your percent of direct oh, yeah, percent. To consumer sales, yeah. Yep. So slow. Well, there's two percentages we've been really tracking, which maybe I think was someone else's question. So, one is the percent we sell over our own bar versus our wholesale. So we self distribute. So we're we are our own wholesaler. Um, that's slowly been growing each year um, by volume. By volume, we were probably at 65% outside wholesale to bars and restaurants, 35% inside-ish before COVID. And then that dropped to zero outside <laughs> and a little bit this much inside. And we've been climbing um, up, up the ladder again and it keeps changing. So we, as the tap room was to go only for a while, then it was, you know, maybe 50, 50. And then as soon as we were able to open with, you know, social distancing, um, it's now swung probably 80, 20, but I know those numbers don't matter. What I would say is our goal is we'll swing back that other way, probably 70% outside, 30% inside. Um, and then our can, you were asking can percentages. Once again, all predictions and stuff have kind of gone out the window, but during May when we were down, we actually did double the amount in cans than we did in drafts, including inside. So it was a big lifesaver for us. Um, it's already flipped back the other way, obviously, with being able to reopen, at least limited the tap room. So maybe 25%, 20% cans, something like that now. So, and actually we hope that stays. And a general rule of thumb is eventually Packaging is always bigger than draft for almost any brand. So it'll flip and we'll be anywhere between 60 and 70% packaged when we fully have another brewery up and running. Awesome. Hopefully soon. So that's <laughs> a lot of percentages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, <laughs> I think we have one more beer to crack open, Jason. Oh, we do. That's less boring. Let's see that. <laughs> well, it's not boring to me. I was just saying maybe I was boring people, so. Okay, this is our If You Want Blood. This is our Blood Orange IPA, talking about fun, why beers come around. This one I can say the band name because we did it as a collaboration with this great punk rock band originally out of Oklahoma City. Most of them live in LA now called Red City Radio. And we've connected with them over the years. Our friends still in studios that they've recorded at. And we actually did some a couple of really special shows here where they played at a local venue that we supported. And then the next morning we set up and they came and did a brunch acoustic show with some of the bands from that and did all this cool extra stuff and it was awesome. But anyways, with one of those, we wanted to kind of do a collab beer. And they had just, this is the name of one of their songs off their new album, Sky Tigers, If You Want Blood. So they, we had already been talking about blood orange with something. And so the idea of blood orange IPA, and that's not a brand new idea, but I was like, perfect. Like the idea, can we do it? It's always difficult though. Once again, is balancing fruit versus the style you're going after. So that one doesn't take over the other. So I'm gonna crack this open and keep talking too. Um, the fun thing with this is this is all, 
Italian blood orange. But we did accent, accent it a little. We actually used some zest orange oil in this, which is just regular orange oil. But, but all the actual juice is Italian blood orange. The one other issue with, that we do is we tend to not do sweet beers. Um, so, which might seem obvious, but other places will on purpose leave beers sweet. Oh, there we go. Um, but we don't. I, that's a little bit of a personal preference that I tend to like drier beers. And, um, and this is one of those exceptions. So one way, because we lose our sweetness, unlike, you know, uh, wine cooler kind of style, and that's one way you can get fruit flavor. That's where things like if we use a zest or some of the oil, you'll get back the aroma and then back to the weird thing with the human brain is it changes the flavor and the sense of fruit in it, even though we've let the fruit ferment out completely. So, so this one definitely has that sense of sweetness, even though it's fairly dry beer, six and a half percent alcohol. Um, a little that's from that zest oil. And then we also use a little bit, my secret ingredient with a lot of beers, especially with fruit, is coriander. So, which has been around in like a Belgian wit forever. It's a really interesting um, spice because it actually gives a lot more orangey notes than people realize, unless you're a good cook. I didn't realize it. But um, it really is a cool balance for fruit and beer. So I tend different levels, but um, to use it in beers. And coriander in a IPA is not that unusual either if you've had Belgian white IPAs. Um, so we actually use dried orange peel in the brew as well. And that actually adds more bitterness than orange. The coriander adds a little more of the aroma. So the bitterness for an IPA, we actually don't use a lot of hop bitterness. We use peel bitterness, which is a slightly different, but same feel for an IPA. This is great. I'm on my third beer. This is great. So, what is it? Wednesday? Yeah. Who cares? Who's that? So, we have a question um, coming from Diana. So, she asks What types of hops do you use for the different types of beers that you brew? So, IPA versus lager versus red ale, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. There's really, for a while, there's really almost, there's like two main differentiators and now it's split a little bit because of the southern hemisphere but really you had your noble hops were the traditional european grown hops and those you may have heard things like hallertau middle fruit or czech saws english fuggles real funny names but they all tended to be a little bit spicy maybe a little aromatic floral um, and those are in your classic styles we use a hundred percent hallertau middle fruit which is a very famous German hop in rooftops. It's actually more floral than people think, but there's a little bit of a spice or earthy note it can have to it. It's mild, low bitterness and a really classic old school kind of hop. Um, it's also my secret hop I use in a lot of fruit beers that I don't want strong hop flavor, but you do need some bitterness, and a little bit of hops to balance out the sweetness from the beer. But in other beers, like if you want blood or IPAs, if Diana was asking, that's where there's a big swing, the American Hop Development Program, in particular in Yakima Valley in Washington, and I think it's Oregon State in particular, is an ag school out there, and CSU was way behind, but Oregon State many years ago started developing and open sourcing breeding of hop, new hop varietals, and they open sourced, if I didn't say open sourced it, they developed Cascade originally for Coors, which is actually became this very classic American hop. It's what, if you guys know Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, uh, Coors kind of helped develop it. Sierra Nevada owns it. I think it might be 100% of that beer. Um, but from that, all these new awesome varietals, and it absolutely exploded American hops back onto the scene. By the way, we used to grow hops. They grow everywhere, like a weed almost used to grow in New York, all over Colorado, but really almost all that movement went up there because of the ag program, single school, which is pretty amazing. Then a whole industry developed around it. But that's where you get these new, you've heard hops like Citra, uh, Centennial, 
well, Idaho 7, which was Idaho, but generally the Northwest. But what they really started developing was um, there's two aspects of hops. There's these alpha acids, which is a bittering compound. And you usually use that in the boil to help balance sweetness. But hops also have oils in them. And it's kind of the secondary use of hops or the second half of the brew. You either add them late or into the fermenter as a dry hop where you don't get the um, dissolving of the bittering compounds, but you get the oil because now there's alcohol in the beer. The oil gets extracted. And that's where you get these fruity, tropical kind of IPA notes that America kind of became famous for and why it relaunched American craft beer onto the world. Now, every, now Germans are doing cool new aromatic hops again, like uh, Mandarina, Bavaria, um, and then New Zealand in particular in the Southern Hemisphere. Interestingly, that whole started because hops are a single crop year. They're harvested once in the fall, which is a real bummer when you're trying to plan out a whole year of brewing. So really the big brewers helped develop the South American market because it harvests on the exact opposite season. So they were sourcing a lot of their regular hops down in the Southern Hemisphere, a little bit Australia, but a lot of New Zealand. But from there, just like the Northwest, they started developing their own hops. And you have a lot of terroir. You can grow the same hop and bring it over, and it'll, it'll taste and smell differently based on the local region. So that's the new big buzz is a lot of these South American hops. Very cool. And this kind of might tie into, um, we had a question from Jason um, asking what innovations are happening in the beer industry and where can a chemical engineer fit in? For, well, first I'll do just quick ones. There's always new styles and things that try. Sometimes they're truly a fad and then sometimes they stick around. When, um, when any new fad comes on, we tend to not first try to, you know, be the front of, you know, any crazy new thing that happens but we're always open-minded about it. And I always said, right now you might have heard hazy or juicy IPAs. And for a while, but in reality, there's some really new and interesting techniques that came out of it that will live on and the style is probably going to live on. And I always said, hey, the American IPA, the West Coast IPA was literally a fad beer at one point. And it's not going away and it's now the number one skew, you know, here. We had one question come in um, from Jeff saying, this was fun. Are we going to do any more of these? We will, Jeff. Um, we don't have any more planned for the summer, um, but we are hoping to make this more of a regular thing, possibly once a quarter. Um, and we've been in talk um, with some other buffers that we have for the fall. So hopefully we'll see a few more of these and uh, um, so we have a question from Megan. She asked, do you have any beers that are less hoppy and more malty? Yeah, we do. Um, we actually have a full, a year round beer called Hold Steady. That is a dark Scotch ale. And in reality, it's very similar to a robust porter. We had tried doing a Scotch ale, which has a little bit of smoked peated malt in it. And it just wasn't working this before we opened. We also want to do a dark beer, but didn't really have a stout and we combined a recipe before we opened and it's been really great so we do that um and it's a pretty big beer it's about seven and a half percent so malty sweetness um we use a chocolate rye in it so not very bitter at all not only not from hops but no no um bitterness from the burnt no burnt flavors either we also do with novo coffee who roasts about three doors down um we usually um not during COVID, but do a coffee version of that. We take their espresso, we do a, a cold press of that espresso with our beer. And by the way, coffee and beer share a lot. So I've really gotten into coffee as well. So um, the way those are roasted, like our malts, uh, we do as well. We usually do uh, um, an old ale, which is kind of like a light barley wine, which is just a super malty, low bitterness beer in the fall. We barrel age that and it's called Nobody's Darling. So it takes on a lot of whiskey notes. So yes, we do some, some multi flavored beers for sure. Awesome, that sounds amazing. And I also, it's great to hear that you guys collab with other local roasteries and places in Colorado, um, local bands too. I mean, that's amazing. Are there any other breweries that you're interested in collaborating with? Oh yeah, um, it's once again, 
we just missed, we are, Collab Fest is a big thing that the Colorado Brewers Guild has started each year. It's been really fun. We don't do a ton of true collaborations, we, or at least directly with other breweries. If anything, maybe our MO has been, let's do it with a band or for another event. Some of our, like King of Carrot Flowers, our Carrot Elderflower was a collaboration with a local food farm here in Elyria Swansea, one of our neighborhoods next to us that's kind of a food desert. And they grow, far, they grow food for the local community. So we do a charity event each year. So we'll brew beer for them. But um, of course, it'd be fun to do some breweries. I always thought it'd be fun to do like a European brewery collab, I think would be really fun. Uh, it's always fun though to have friends in and then we'll definitely do some band collabs too. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys have a fun music vibe. Uh, yeah. Your brewery is super fun. Uh, Megan has asked, is it possible to get your beer in Seattle? It is not quite possible to get in Seattle and a little bit because of laws, back to still some post-prohibition laws, in particular because the beer lobby, especially craft, is nowhere near as powerful as the wine lobby. The wine lobby has passed, I think in every, all 50 states you can ship to the home um, in all of those 50 states. Colorado is not one of those states, except during COVID, we can ship within Colorado now. No, sorry, we can't ship. We can now deliver home. We still cannot directly ship to a home in Colorado. But we are looking, there are a cool couple intermediate groups that take beers. And in fact, in particular, the Northwest. Um, and blanking on the name, but Sammy just walked out. But we may be signing a little bit of a deal with them, and they tend to take specialty releases and there's quite a few Colorado breweries. They'll pull them up there, you can order it and they'll deliver it straight to your home. So I would guess that would be by the fall. So watch out for that. Awesome. Looks like Jeff is also interested in getting you guys in Summit County. So keep that. Oh, there mind. we go. <laughs> Summit County might be more likely for sure. Wait, Summit County, Colorado, Summit County? Okay. I, that's how I took it, yeah. I yes. Think so. Once in a while we pop up there for fun stuff. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Jason, we are close to time. Um, I know you got cut off for a minute, though, so if there's anything else you want to talk about or chat for a minute. No, it's free. great. Um, like I said, feel free to write in or through the program. I love following up with questions, especially engineers that want to get, or, you know, are looking either to get in the industry or just interested for their own reasons. Um, always love answering questions and sharing the knowledge. So I hope to see some people in real life at some point, but... <laughs> For now, it's all on Zoom, and we're at the mercy of uh, internet connections. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jason, we really do. We super appreciate your time, and this was a really great way to connect, even though we can't all be together right now. Um, but Ratio is open, guys, so if you're local, um, swing by. They have a really awesome, they close down Larimer Street, so you can sit outside, um, be socially distant and everything. Um, so check them out if you're in town. But again, really appreciate your time, Jason. And thank you everyone else for joining us this evening. Um, like I mentioned before, we're gonna send out a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, I'll include a survey so you can let us know about this event, send any other questions. And then we are hoping to do this series again in the fall. So we'll be sure to keep you updated um, on our future events, but really appreciate everyone being here. Um, cheers. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye.